Oh, good afternoon, George Conference, and thank you so much for having me. So this story actually starts a couple of years ago when I first joined WISE. We looked and we spoke like this. And honestly, I think it's safe to say it was broken. And like so many in tech, we weren't alone. We drifted into a sea of sameness, A, B, tested into oblivion, and we were all aboard the boat called Bland. Trustworthy blue color palette? Yep. Generic but cheap to produce illustrations? Absolutely. Writing, indistinguishable as wise. Yeah. One product screen where you can see six different teams working on it. Who doesn't have that problem, right? That's OK. Where was our creativity? Why was best practice enough? But most importantly, why was this a missed opportunity? 70%. That's the amount of customers who join WISE because of a referral from a friend. Of the million customers who signed up last quarter, 700,000 came from word of mouth. A product so fast you tell a friend about it. A product so cheap you spend a dinner talking about a banking app. But was it so well designed that you tell someone? Did what I show earlier emotionally connect with you? Did it delight you? No, not a fucking chance. So, on March 1st, we introduced a new face of WISE to the world. One designed to help us shift from stale to stand out and give our customers a design worth talking about. The new brand is built around the single universal idea of the world's money. It's deliberately different. Wise isn't like the rest. We think and we act differently. Now we have to look to match. We developed custom tapestries inspired by the symbolism on banknotes. These bring life and energy into every part of our system, like our digital cards here, which are a key word of mouth driver. We didn't want to feel like anyone else out there. And now we have the system to match, standing out for what makes us, us. It's also universally accessible. We excel the latest WCAG and APCH accessibility standards. And we do that without losing a visual punch. This filters in to every part of our system, from colors to input fields. Every part of WISE is designed to work the same for everyone. So we know we can show up as one WISE, whoever you are, wherever you go. And finally, it's local on a global scale. We respond to the countries and cultures we serve, not just reflecting them. We speak hundreds of languages and work the world over. We designed a custom typeface inspired by scripts across the world. We paired that with Inter, which works in 147 languages and all types of screens. I love how great it looks in different languages. From our website to our product, we show up as one wise for everyone all executed across three platforms, 62 autonomous teams, 170 countries, millions of opinions, no CEO driving it, 16 million customers in one big bang. We went from this to this, and we gave customers a design worth talking about. And understandably, right, I get a lot of questions about this work, and I, I always hoped it would be about the sick visuals, but it's not. It's mostly people going, how did you do this? How did you convince stakeholders? Especially when it's not a top-down organization. So today I wanted to talk about that and share a few bits from our journey from stale to stand out. So it might seem incredibly obvious, but the bigger the problem, the bigger the impact. And when we set out on this project, we set out to solve one of the biggest problems we face at WISE. When WISE began in 2012, we were all about transfers, sending money from A to B. But over time, that's evolved, from a single focus on sending money to a feature-rich international banking alternative. And by 2021, we could see more and more of our customers were using us as an account. That's over 30% of consumers sending, spending, receiving money with us. It doesn't sound like a transfer app, to me. 
We need your account. One account for the world's money. That's pretty big. But becoming the wise account wasn't just as easy as saying it. There was a gnarly set of problems which lay behind that, from redefining ourselves across our entire customer journey to scaling our system to work across the world. This was a massive problem. And the temptation when facing a massive problem is to divide it up into smaller chunks, distribute it across multiple squads and different teams, empower them to get to the answer themselves. And before I joined WISE, we tried that. Transfer WISE to WISE. Account messaging tweaked above the hero. Card nudges 10 pixels above the fold. Small little changes in our navigation. Tiny changes to a CTA here. And the reality was none of this was going to work because the scale of our solution was far less than the scale of our problem. Think about it. 500 screens, an entire customer journey, a business transforming entirely. Do you think that was going to work? No. As a designer, too often we get sucked into thinking about the individual pieces. But that isn't what a customer experiences. They experience the sum of all of these parts and how they come together as a whole. So the simple reality I've been learning over many years is you can't A-B test your way to excellence. If you want a breakthrough, it requires a bet. So what you need to do is ask yourselves, and be honest, because most people lie here, is this best solved through multiple iterative steps, or is it time for a bigger leap? And are we just scared of making that big leap? Do we really need innovation or more variations? So when I think about what lays the foundation for standout work, I always believe it starts with teams scaling up their ambition, committing to doing something bold and coming at it with bold ideas. So now we were clear on what we wanted to do. One account for the world's money. We had to design that, and it was really, really hard. It took us six weeks to get to our first initial concept, and then it took eight months to make that concept work. Every single element from logo, illustrations, input, tone of voice had to be rigorously thought through and developed. Let's take one for example, our tapestries. These began with very humble beginnings, nothing more than an image pulled from Unsplash and a very passionate pitch. Imagine these textures inspired by the world. And let's be honest, right? They sucked, absolutely sucked. But when you review ideas for potential over perfection, you give design work the room to grow. So, a few weeks later, a bit more work, we checked back in. They were getting better. Yes, they looked like a jungle still, but you could see positive progress. More, more making, more making, and in one we saw something, the Sydney Opera House. And we said, what if we referenced our customers' movements in these assets? Photography, colors, typography, all from their world. So we kept making and making and making. And hundreds of iterations later, we slowly moved towards the tapestries, a new semiotic for the world's money, inspired by the symbolism on banknotes, but updated for a digital age. These bring life and energy to so many parts of our system, and customers absolutely love it. It was exactly the same story with typography. We wanted something which felt inspired by the world which we serve, so we studied scripts across the world. It took hundreds of iterations, an unquestionable amount of Figma boards to even get close to the answer. Simple on the surface, but deep exploration behind it. What this shows to me, though, is you've just got to test a lot of things in order to figure out the answer. You do the work so customers don't have to. Every single element went through this level of development. What this ultimately shows when I was reflecting on it is great work is rarely this flash of brilliance it's often perceived to be. It's just a lot of sweat. You've got to be wrong, 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 wrong
and then maybe you stand the small chance of being right. So make fast and edit slow. And if you're going to make this type of work, I can't encourage you enough to make your way into conviction. So now we had this amazing new design, and we systemized every single part of it and housed it in a single location, wise.design. This allowed designers, developers, marketers, and everyone in between to understand our vision and execute on it with minimal oversight. But saying wise.design was the end state would be a lie. Guidance has its limits, and the reality on the ground was a tad different. So we started by taking our old design system and remapping it into the new one. Then, when we were ready, we flipped the switch. And, well, the results, they were awesome. It turned kind of dry, unaccessible screens like this into bold visual ones like this. Or screens that lacked that visual punch like this into beautiful ones like this. All with a simple flip of a switch. And to me, this shows the power of getting the basics right in design. Nothing particularly complex, just executed to the highest standards. This was just a new theme, new tokens, new assets. The challenge was, though, if you clicked around a bit, it got messy. And basically, where we didn't have a design adoption, it was bad. So what we needed to do was bring more teams into the design system. So we ran one of those mega QA sessions across every platform, and we made what we dubbed internally called our naughty list, the people who had made custom components, and we needed to get them out onto the system. So we went out to those teams, and we were able to transform custom, unsystematic screens like this into beautiful, unified screens like this. Nothing here changed in the underlying UX. It was purely the UI layer. It took a developer just a couple of minutes to code. It was exactly the same story here. This wall of text was just some poor component choices. By bringing them onto the new system, we're able to give a massive visual upgrade in just a short step. When I was reflecting on this, though, I realized this pretty clear reality, that building a system is the only way we could have executed this at our scale. Think about it, the alternative. Hundreds of screens, thousands of custom components. It would have taken five years to get this out. But the reflection I had is systems shouldn't be developed in secret. One of the best decisions we made was to turn the rebrand on as early as possible for all of our internal wisers. That way, week by week, month by month, everyone could see it getting better in public. They knew it was starting to deliver on our vision. So, while there's no one-size-fits-all approach to shipping work at scale, I do believe a lot of the best work I've seen is shipped systematically. So, we've got this amazing new system, and everyone's like, but, but how did you convince people to do it? And the reality I've learned throughout my career is if your work isn't gaining traction, it's for one of two reasons. You're working on the wrong thing, or it's presented poorly. As a designer, I can't underestimate the power of a good sales pitch. Because strategy is storytelling. It's how you coalesce a large group of people around a single universal idea. And if you're taking on a project this big, you need one hell of a story. So as you start to gather that story, make sure your work's good enough to communicate your thinking. Don't share too early because you think it's worth it. It doesn't help. Take your time to make your story good and share to create clarity not confusion. Always gather feedback from those most impacted first. For us, it was the developer guilds. And when you're talking to people, always frame your story in the listener's language. Designers, developers, PMs, compliance, they all care about different things. So don't speak design when they speak PM. As your confidence grows, you can scale up your conversation from team to squad to tribe to the entire company. And when you get your moment, always opt for a splash. Don't worry about the details. Inspire people. Because what you want is this. Excitement creates momentum within an org.
and you can use momentum to drive a project all the way through to implementation. Spreading your story into digestible formats, planning, blog posts. And when you do this, make sure to be buttoned up. When you're impacting this many teams, the way you communicate is a direct reflection of your project and your team. So take the time to do it well. Bit by bit, people showed up and played their part. Not because we forced them to, but because they wanted to. The rebrand became a reality. As I think about this, this is so true. If your org doesn't believe in your work, customers won't believe in your work. So use the power of storytelling to change perspectives, and most importantly, inspire people into action. Thank you for listening. I'm Cam. Thank you so much for sharing this, Cameron. No we love your story. Let's take some questions from the audience. Who wants to know something? Um, yes, we have somebody here, please. Uh, hi. Uh, one question about this 70% that you mentioned at the beginning. Uh, how did you count that? How do, we, how do we come to that number? Yeah. Well, obviously, we measure all of the ways which people come into WISE, and uh, we have uh, referrals as one big part of it. And that word of mouth is a big mix of uh, organic word of mouth, but also through our referral program, like referral links and stuff like that. Thank you. All right. Do we have more questions here? Somewhere there? I've got one here. I don't know. I don't see it. Ah, we have one here in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Hi. Hi. Uh, thanks for your talk. Um, I want to know what was the fight with the legacy code? Because many companies, we are trying to do something similar to what you did in WISE. Yeah. yeah. But then we are facing legacy code and legacy decisions. And this is very hard for us to overcome. Yeah. So on the subject of legacy code, like it might seem crazy, but in 12 years, 10 years as a company, we have quite a lot of legacy code as well. So one of the things which worked really well from a system perspective was by turning on the new theme and the new rebrand as early as possible, it incentivized teams to not be left behind. So even if it took some teams, say, three months to get onto the new system, they did actually make those upgrades. So I wouldn't say it's like, uh, it's basically kind of inspiring people into action because they want to be part of something big. And no one really wants that old flow, which is super outdated, I guess. So that was kind of the method we used. And I think it really worked well because it wasn't me going around with a stick prodding people, uh, which I don't think would have been as successful. Uh, let's take one more from our remote audience. So okay. what feedback did you get after the relaunch? And are, is there any advice you would give to other companies who are planning a big relaunch? Oh, yeah. Uh, the feedback's been astoundingly positive. Like, I did a big uh, company presentation before it launched, being like, trying to tell everyone, like, everyone expect terrible things to happen. Uh, and it went, the complete opposite happened. Customers loved it. Uh, community of designers loved it. And I think it was just like an overdue refresh. So I think the advice I would give to people is like, you know, it seems scary. Like, I called my mentor the week before, and they said that the fact that you're scared is a good thing. And so that means you pushed yourself. So I would say, like, continue to push yourself. And again, like, communication really matters. So just make sure you're really buttoned up as you go into it. Nice. And one last question. Of course, yeah. uh, how would you identify if a company has a good identity or if they're in need of a rebranding or a new design system? Yeah, so I, I was talking about this with someone earlier. And, like, a lot of the misconception is that's a rebrand just for a rebrand's sake. It's not. It was using the power of design to create change within an organization. So you know, we were a company in a transformative phase, and it just so happened that I felt one of the best ways to align an entire organization around a set of objectives was to use the power of design. So I think what you should really say is, like, why are we doing this? Because a lot of the time, it's like, you know, designers just got bored. We want it to look better, which I think is a really bad reason to do something. But if you really do feel that, like, we can use design to create large-scale change, that's when tools like this are a really good weapon in your arsenal. Perfect. Thank you so much, cool. Cameron. No worries. Thank you.